in the sort of overall title of the talk, uh, of the, of the uh, series, the, uh, there was a mention about you know, uh, children, scientists, and animals alike. And you know, we have that sort of scientist thing in there. And um, I came from the lab of Susan Carey at MIT back in the 70s. And that was the big thing that she was interested in. And um, in, in particular, she was sort of interested in reinterpreting Piaget um, and taking the idea of the child as little scientist quite seriously. Um, uh, do animals have cognition? You might think, well, obviously, look what you've just seen. Um, but what I want to look at is, is just briefly the sort of slippery slope argument about, well, if dolphins have it, do cats, dogs, and then going all the way down. Um, what is cognition? Um, so, so that was, again, one of the aims of the uh, of, the, of the series was to try and come to a deeper understanding of what cognition is. And um, I'm just going to give you again my personal view of what I think cognition is and what it, what it requires. Um, and then to talk about some of the research I've done that looks at interactions between language and cognition. So, um, just so going back to Susan Carey's work, um, Piaget talked about children as little scientists in his sort of uh, constructivist view of the world and his mechanisms of uh, accommodation, assimilation, and so on, were these sort of analogies to biological adaptation. And um, that essentially um, organisms incorporate demands in the environment, either through evolution or through development. And so he was like, sort of looking at the developmental end of things. Um, essentially, what um, Susan Carey said was, well, let's look at what science so how science actually does change, and is there a similarity between what goes on when um, scientists, you know, scientific theories change, or scientific paradigms change, in sort of Kuhn's words at the time, or, and the way that you have conceptual change in, in children. And is there a distinction between what you call radical change and, and sort of everyday uh, theory change? So one of, the, one of the sort of hallmarks of radical change, that is when you sort of have that kind of paradigm shift, as Kuhn talked, about was this idea of incommensurability, that your whole system of knowledge changes, and so the sort of the basic um, way that concepts fit into the, the new conceptual systems means that even though you may be using the same terms to refer to things like motion and, and you know, uh, whatever, um, the, 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 because they are within different conceptual systems now, that they that essentially they're not intertranslatable. And so this idea of incommensurability, I, th I think, is a sort of very powerful one when we think about um, what happens when, when you do get conceptual change and whether you do get that kind of um, radical change or not. Um, what Susan Carey did in her book, uh, Conceptual Change in Childhood, um, was to do a series of very elegant experiments where she demonstrated exactly what was going on in kids' heads as they went from, from um, one kind of conceptual system to another. And she identified these within the domains of uh, biological concepts of life and, and uh, the notion of animacy, and also within physical concepts of things like weight and density, and showed how, um, as children matured, they went from very sort of personal um, theories, or sort of folk theories, if you like, or um, where they, the, the sort of concepts involved in those series were, were primarily based on um, a sort of psychological or, or if you like, everyday experience uh, kinds of criteria to more objective science-like concepts. And so what happened in uh, development a lot of the time were dif differentiation of concepts. And so whereas uh, at one time kids were not able to differentiate between things like weight and density, and so we were unable to pre predict um, uh, that, that two objects could have of the same weight and, and looking the same could have different, sorry, of the same size <laughs> could have different weights because they didn't understand the differentiation of density. Um, and showing how that sort of emerged too. And also with uh, co biological concepts, how um, the notions like being alive and so on initially had these sort of, uh, were based on things like movement and things that were not sort of biological in nature. Um, so that, that was sort of, to me, that I see that as uh, the way in which um, children, uh, children's cognitive development and the de development of theory change in science um, can show these sort of parallels and how they can sort of feed off of each other. And also, um, we, you know, in going back to Piaget, the kinds of phenomena that he came up with, like conservation, which I'm sure everyone's 
pretty familiar with. Um, instead of talking about what's, what was changing in terms of uh, changes in logical structure, which is what Piaget talked about, the sort of, this sort of underlying logic changed, and then they could make these new inferences, um, the idea was that actually what's going on is that children are actually making scientific discoveries about what matter is, and so the ways in which matter can change and when it can't change, because not all things are conserved, as you can demonstrate in, in undergraduate classes pretty well. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so the, the connection I see here is, is between uh, uh, conceptual change in children and in science as, as being a sort of a feeding off each other and having some fairly similar uh, mechanisms going on. So again, in, the, in terms of the background, um, asking a question like, do animals have cognition may seem kind of silly because you know, they're really smart and they can do all these things. But I, I, I don't know how many people have read this paper, but it's one of my favorites, which is called um, Why Paramecia Don't Have Mental Representations. And it's by Jerry Foda, uh, one of my favorite philosophers of mind. And um, basically, he, he asked this question, um, these little single-celled uh, organisms, um, surely they don't have mental representations but dolphins do, so where do we meet, right? So where is the cutoff point um, at which we can say, you know, these guys will have mental representations, but these guys don't, right? Is there, is there a sort of break point there, is, or is it just a slippery slope by which we can start to say, well, maybe humans don't have mental representations? Well, he basically, um, what he sort of comes up with is this uh, criterion which he says that mental representations are operations that are what he calls non-nomological. So nomological has to do with sort of being governed by physical law. So the idea is that if you have, an, say, a behavior that is triggered by a particular stimulus, but every stage of that, of that process in that is, is sort of governed by basic physical laws. In other words, you know, if a light goes on, move towards it. You, know, you can do that very simply by, by simple physics. Um, but rather, um, so mental representations are non-logical. In other words, they act on information in, in terms of symbolic structures. So the, you, you're, you're operating on representations and intentionalities rather than um, at pure brute force physics. Okay, so now how you find out whether that's going on or not is another question. But I think it's a, it's a really um, neat Way, way that he came up with sort of making that distinction. And I think it's an important distinction to think about, um, especially um, within the last 10 or 20 years when the idea of representations and symbolic structures has been challenged fairly severely within using sort of neural network and connectionist type models. And, and to sort of really think about what exactly we mean by symbolic structures and mental representations and whether we need them or not. Um, so basically, um, I see cognition as a medium through which indirect or non nomological information structures are mentally represented and available, available for manipulation through reasoning, propositional attitudes, problem solving, and so on. To form systematic knowledge structures, as in the case of conceptual change and the child's understanding of the physical world. Okay, so that sort of kind of ties it all together in my own kind of personal view of what we're studying here. Um, so let's bring in language now. So what is language in the, in the context of all this? Well, basically, um, at, at a sort of a rough level, is uh, that language is a kind of externalization of mental representation, and it's an externalization for the purposes of communication with others. So you, you're uh, making your mental structures external so that that can be transmitted to another person by whatever medium that, that is, whether it be through the internet or face-to-face -face conversation or sign language or whatever. Um, so one of, one of the issues that comes up then is um, to what extent um, language itself plays a role in conceptual development. So in other words, does the existence of language change the nature in which co conceptual development takes place? Or rather, does, does all of this sort of take, you know, does everything happen separately? So, you know, your, your thinking is over here, and language is over here, and now the twain do meet. Or is there more of an interaction? So I'll talk about some studies I did on that. And also, um, questions about where do linguistic representations emerge from? 
and do they come from conceptual representation? So when you look at an infant in the first year of life, when they're not actually doing any real talking, um, is there anything about the way that they construe reality that points us toward something that they can build upon when they start to use words and sentences? And so what I'm particularly interested in is uh, the idea of argument structure. So I'm going to do the second question first and then the first question second. Um, and so my, my very sort of simple model of, of how, how infants uh, would perceive events and then sort of map this onto arguments, you know, onto language, is that basically there's this sort of, <coughs> there's a, if you like, uh, to, to quote William James, the blooming, buzzing confusion of the world, sort of stuff going on outside, uh, you know, people moving around and everything sort of fairly random in a lot of ways, unless you sort of categorize it. But basically, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. And there's, even within uh, major activities, there are sort of all kinds of sub-activities that we do having to do with eye gaze and, and you know, subtle movements and so on. And from all of that, um, it's the purpose, the, 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 uh, in order to, to perceive an event as an event is that you have to sort of figure out from all these activities, what is the point, right? What, is, what, is, what are these people trying to do in front of me? Uh, and you know, what is the aim or the goal of, of what they're doing? So I, I refer to that as the main act. And then and the main act has some relevant participants. In other words, people who are participating. And then there's all this other stuff going on that doesn't have anything to do with the action, has nothing to do with the meaning of the action. The, there may be language going on too. And, uh, but what we're trying to do is to map this co cognitive representation onto something like a linguistic representation, which is something like a verb and its argument. So if someone's giving an object to someone else, then you want to represent this, not as this blooming, buzzing confusion, but this nice sort of discrete hierarchical structure. Okay. So the question is, uh, can, we do, can we find any evidence that this goes on before language actually gets acquired? So um, what I'm interested in is this idea of relevance. Um, so when we, when we talk about people being uh, agents and patients and objects being involved as arguments of an action, um, one of the things that the child has to distinguish is between what are, what are relevant elements and what are irrelevant elements. In other words, the, the things that are relevant to an action are the things that matter. And, and if they were not there, then it would change the meaning of the event significantly. Whereas irrelevant things, if you take them away, um, they don't change the meaning. The same thing's going on. So the way in which I looked at this was to, look, um, to present uh, infants. These, uh, the first studies I did were with 10-month-olds. I, I eventually did do some younger babies too. But um, mostly I was looking at sort of infants who haven't started talking yet, but they're sort of right on the, on the border of that. Um, and uh, to see if they would distinguish between uh, things that are potential arguments to an, a verb that described an action versus not. And so, okay, so now, now we're good. Okay, so these are the videos that we showed these 10 month olds. They weren't as squished down as this because we didn't have this guy in the way. Um, so these are actually normal sized people. There you go. So, so here you see a girl giving a, a toy to a boy. And so in this, in this video, you have three arguments, if you like. You have the girl, the boy, and the toy, where the, all three are relevant. In particular, the toy is relevant to the action here. And if you take the toy away, can you just see that? Yeah. It's, it's not really giving anymore. It's sort of everything but, because the toy, it's, a sort of, it's changed the meaning of the activity. On the other hand, if you have the girl hugging the boy, um, carrying the toy. Here, in this case, the toy is not relevant because um, if you take the toy away, it's still hugging. Right? So that's basically the premise of this experiment. Is like if you if you show them an ins uh, a series, you habituate them to uh, uh, giving with a toy, and then you take the toy away. Do they show increased looking um, as opposed to? Uh, showing them an instance of hugging, and you take the toy away, um, do, they, do they increase looking there? 
What am I looking for now? Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Why is this? Oh, okay. So, um, so basically, we did a standard habituation pr uh, procedure. So your infant looks, um, and then when uh, you get down to 50% looking time, you switch to the either you you alternate between old and new videos, and, and where the new one, the the habituation video is giving with the toy, and uh, habituation is and the test is without the toy, and basically. Um, I've got this tiny screen now. Okay. <laughs> um, so here are the habituation trials. This is for give is the uh, solid lines, hug is the dotted lines. These are habituation trials. Last three trials. And then uh, this is the old stimulus. So this is the same as what they had here with the toy. And the new is without the toy. Okay. And what you can see is that in the case of give, when, they, uh, when you take the toy away, they increase their looking time. That's a significant increase in looking time. Whereas with hug, they do not increase the looking time. And if anything, it goes down a little bit. So taking the toy away for hug um, does not make them look longer at the, at the, uh, at the um, video. So that suggests we have sort of prima facie evidence that um, there is some uh, uh, Notice that they are noticing the disappearance of the toy in the case of giving but not hugging, and suggesting that uh, they understand that one it's relevant in one case and not the other. Now um, we we did a whole bunch of variations on this to test for saliency and things like that. One of the interesting things we did was to uh, present these upside down. Uh, so in, so just like how you know the Margaret Thatcher illusion where you turn the face upside down and you don't see the emotion in the face and the sort of meaning you know it's hard to recognize faces upside down well if you play a, an action upside down which I dare try and do this um, if you play an action upside down um, I'm actually going to do this with eye tracking because we, we did it all with, with um, we did it all with eye tracking too Or not. Oh, it's not giving me anything now. I'm not getting anything. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is. Um, so this is the same thing upside down. So, uh, so I, I, how much time do I have? Not much. Um, Five minutes. Okay, but okay. I'm just going to give you the sort of uh, base story here. With in this case, they did not show increased looking time when you took the toy away. Right. So unlike the the upright one. Now um, I have some videos of it, but, but I don't have time to show you. But we did all of these with eye tracking on these infants, and basically, when when um, you show them the give in the upright. Um, the normal position, um, they, they, when you when you see them during the give uh, trials, they're looking at the toy, they're looking at the boy, the girl, they're looking at their faces. So they're doing this kind of triangulation between the three things, and you can see very clearly. And when you take the toy away, they're looking to where the toy was, and they're looking to the faces. So it's the same thing with hug. They're looking at the face, looking at the faces. They're not looking at the toy. Right? So what do you think they do with the give upside down? It's identical to give up. <laughs> it's like if you could turn this thing upside down, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the give and, and the hug. So they're looking at all the right things, but when you take away the toy, they're not dishabituating. So, so it's, it's sort of like they can see the toy, and it's sort of you know, pr pr very prominent, but um, they just don't you know, show an effect when you, when you take it away. And we even did this weird thing. Um, look at what we... They really noticed this. So we, we photoshopped the, the, the toy from the give video and put it on top of the hug video just to control everything for like the movement of the toy and everything. And the babies, like, you know, half of them like, were crying. And it was like, they really noticed this. They really, it really kind of spooked them out. But when you took the toy away, there's no increase in looking time. It was like, they were done, you know? So um, it's sort of the only case where we got, um, 
dishabituation, sorry, where we got the increased looking time was in this, in this case of give. And we did it several times. We did several versions of the experiment. And we always get it for give, and we don't get it for hug or, or any of these other things. Um, and so, um, so it, you know, it suggests that there's some real differentiation going on here. And they really, really, um, I mean, there, there's sort of different levels at which you can uh, um, interpret what's going on here. But it does look like um, something about argument structure is being sort of um, acquired um, very early on. And surely this could be very useful when they actually have to learn verbs like give and hug and so on and, and understand how they get used. Um, and there's, there's sort of other arguments, too, that, that, that kind of const conceptual structure is available. So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about the number work that was mentioned in the introduction. Um, and I think this is a, an interesting case of what happens when you lack language for a, a particular concept. And so number is very interesting because we sort of take number and counting for granted. That, and uh, several people suggest that it is universal. But there are cultures where they have um, very impoverished counting systems. And, and uh, you could probably argue that the, the use of so-called number words are not really number words at all. Um, and so the, the tribe, the culture that I, OK, this is just sort of background again. Um, I'm just going to cut through this. Uh, but basically, this difference between sort of small number enumeration, one through three, and then four and above, where you do sort of approximation, and you have a sort of Weberian uh, kind of magnitude estimation. Um, and there are lots of, uh, lots of um, interesting phenomena developmentally showing that kids can, can conceptualize values of one, two, and three, but not four, five, and six. And so if you, if you contrast uh, three versus two, they will show different, they will sort of, you know, if, if you uh, put three cookies in a box, you take out two, they'll search for the third one. If you put four cookies in a box, you take out two, they won't search for so it's sort of like, you know, you, you get to four and you've sort of blown their minds and say, we're not doing this, we can't do this, four is too much. So, um, you know, there's just this huge amount of literature. So uh, when I s went and studied the Piraha in uh, uh, Amazonia, so they live in these very small villages and these are, this is sort of their typical um, housing. Um, and there'll be like two or three of these huts in a village and like five to ten people. And very, it's a very small uh, lifestyle. Um, and these are just some properties of them. This is uh, me testing uh, one of the uh, participants. And I did a lot with these batteries. They were, they were useful because we always had a lot there, and they, they, they were familiar with them. And um, I, was, I wanted to do some, just some tests where uh, you had a sort of nonverbal test of whether they could perceive numerosities or not. So this was simply um, matching one-to-one -one mapping. This was, uh, I put a cluster of nuts, and they had to use the batteries to um, indicate the same number. Um, this was where I, I put it in a different orientation, so mine was horizontal, it was uh, across, and then um, uh, I made it uneven, and, so, and then drawing lines. These are the actual drawings they did. Um, this is where I had them see these nuts for a brief period. So I, I showed them for about a second, then covered it up. And then they had to sort of reconstruct it from memory. Um, then this is a task where I put, um, I showed them, say, five nuts, put them one at a time in a can, and then pulled them out one at a time. And each time I pulled one out, they had to say whether there were still nuts in the can or whether it was empty or not. And if you, all of these show basically the, you know, the, the performance as the uh, set size increases. And basically, you, uh, this is, this is uh, you put a candy in a box with, um, okay, I'll finish soon. And um, then they have to figure out which box had the candy in it based on the number of fish on the, on the front. And um, they were sort of fairly random at that. So basically, um, they, they tend to do pretty well with small numbers around three, but they, uh, for the larger numbers, they were inaccurate. But when you look at the mean responses across trials and across subjects, and the standard deviation, you get basically a Weber function. And it looks exactly like, so this is like undergraduates doing a, a, a task where they say, OK, do 25 key presses, and then stop when they think, and then you know, it's too fast to count. Um, this is the, the sort of the uh, target size over the, of the standard deviation. And, you, and the bottom graph 
is the coefficient of variation, which is one divided by the other. So it's, it's a, it's, um, so this is the Piraha. So even though they were pretty crappy above three, if you do this coefficient of variation on them, again, they get exactly the same coefficient of variation as these undergrads, um, it's about 0.15. Um, and so this suggests that even though they don't have these numerical um, systems, they, they actually do show a very similar trade-off between small number and large number. And just finally, um, we recently did a study uh, looking at small versus large number. Um, it's similar to a study that, um, this, uh, that was done by Spelke and her colleagues. But um, we, we did sort of one, two, three, four, five, six, presented these arrays, and, and they sort of saw them over and over again, and then they just had to press the key when, when it changed, um, when, it cha when the number changed. Um, and basically what we found was, if just looking at when they were looking straight at uh, numerical quantities, um, this is for one, this is for two, and three, four, five, six, you can see there's no differentiation at, at this level. So this is, these are um, N, N170s uh, using 128 channel EEG. So um, it suggests that there, there are brain mechanisms that sort of undergird this, this sort of small versus large number system of representation. So, um, so then, so just to sort of answer my original questions, you know, I think they're really interesting links to be made between um, the existence of number words and, and cognition for numerical quantities and also that um, we can identify certain pre-linguistic um, uh, stages of development that may feed into language. So, thank you.